Together, we work as one. For better LGBTIQ lives. Outright. Good evening to all our audience and welcome to Out Summit Asia. This year's hybrid conference, which started on December 12 to 14, uh, was such an awesome event. And Outright International is, is also hosting a dedicated two-day Out Summit for a, the Asia region to highlight our work in Asia. Yesterday was day one for Out Summit Asia, where we had discussions on legal changes happening in Indonesia, Singapore, Taiwan, and Vietnam. And on the emerging trends and strategies on gender-based violence with speakers from the Philippines, Japan, and India. And for today, day two, which is the closing ceremony for Out Summit Asia, we have two sessions on older LGBTIQ persons and on self-care. Activists from Nepal, the Philippines, and Taiwan will share insights from the projects they have been implementing on older LGBTIQ persons. And the last session will discuss the importance of self-care for sustainable LGBTIQ activism on gender-based violence with speakers from India, Indonesia, Singapore, and Taiwan. We have translation options located in the lower part of your Zoom screen. It's the globe icon. So, to start the ball rolling, I will open the session on older LGBTIQ persons. So, who are the older LGBTIQ persons in your country? They are considered our forebears since they are the people who made up our LGBTIQ history and are the people who made it possible for LGBTIQ persons today to enjoy the sweet but limited freedoms we have at present. Many older LGBTIQ persons have continued to struggle, thrive, and survive despite the current discrimination and the effects of the lifelong experience of social, legal, and structural violence, abuse, and harassment, exclusion, and visibility, social stigma, isolation, and discrimination that negatively affected their health and well-being and their economic and social security to have a more humane, safe, and secure life. So this session seeks to increase the understanding of the intersectionality of one SOGI SC and aging and present the unique needs and experiences of older LGBTIQ persons. Hopefully, through this discussion, we as LGBTIQ activists will consciously include issues of older LGBTIQ persons when we advocate for SOGI SC inclusive laws, policies, and programs. So we have awesome speakers from the Philippines, uh, Clara Rita Padilla, the Executive Director of Engender Rights Incorporated, uh, from Nepal, Sarita of Meeting in Nepal, and from Taiwan, Frank Wang of Taiwan Hotline. So, hello everyone. Say hi to our speakers. So, first question. It's, this is like a, a beauty contest. We, I'm going to ask the first question and everyone will answer. So, first question. Since we as activists have been working to address the inequalities faced by LGBTIQ persons in our countries, Based on your experience, what are the unique needs and issues faced by older LGBTIQ persons in your own country? So we start with uh, Claire from the Philippines. Okay, thank you, Ging. Um, I'd like to talk about um, the lifelong uh, discrimination of um, older LGBTIQ <laughs> And um, based on, on our work together with Outright International and SAGE, um, to be able to really understand what older people are experiencing, we need to uh, look back into the lifelong discrimination that they have been experiencing as LGBTIQ people. <laughs> now, um, in our work, uh, we interviewed older LGBTI people, and these were people who were 50 years old and above. Um, and uh, we conducted surveys, interviews, and we found that um, some of them would experience family violence. They would be beaten up by their parents, beaten up by siblings and uncles. Um, in school, they would experience gender prescribed uh, dress codes and haircuts. Uh, and as a result, <clears throat> um, you would see that um, many were forced to leave their homes and live in the streets. Um, in schools, because they were not allowed to express their soji, um, this could 
range from not being allowed to enter the premises of the school, not being allowed to graduate in the kind of dress or haircuts that they would want to, or being made to, um, um, they would uh, suffer uh, different kinds of penalties, for example, uh, by the teachers or principal. So as a result, a lot of them would drop out of school. They would not, they did not finish, some did not finish high school or even college. Um, and in the survey, we found that two out of three, actually of the about over a hundred respondents, were not able to finish college or high school. And so they had difficulty finding jobs. They had difficult time um, finding the kinds of jobs that would uh, eventually um, <clears throat> they would uh, find as their niche. Um, and um, with this, uh, even if they had, um, eventually they found their the jobs that they would like, for example, their earnings, they ended up uh, supporting, for example, their families, their nephews, nieces. Um, and sometimes they would also um, provide financial support uh, to some of their, uh, and, and I would uh, call this user-friendly uh, romantic interest. Um, and so when they are older, um, <clears throat> we saw that some of them would experience unemployment. They would not have enough money, um, even for basic needs. They had um, hardly any, any savings. Uh, most uh, you would see would have informal type of work or unstable jobs. Um, they would have part-time uh, work or low pay. Um, and so I would say this, this would range from 30% um, <clears throat> to over uh, half of the uh, respondents. And here, um, because they were involved in informal types of um, work, uh, they would not uh, qualify with the social security. They were not enrolled in social security, uh, so they do not receive the benefit. Um, and now that they're older, they would be faced with health problems, uh, and not just physical, but also <clears throat> um, emotional uh, problems as well. Uh, and not be, and now because they are older, they're not able to work long hours as they used to when they were younger. Um, so as I said, they would um, lack savings, they would have um, problems as regard finances, they would also have unstable housing. Um, and we also found from the survey um, that many chose to either live alone with their friends, with their partners, uh, as opposed to those who would live with their parents or siblings. And so if we talk about needs, um, I would say that uh, 50 years old and above LGBTIQ people uh, definitely uh, should be provided with social security regardless of, of um, the type of work that they had before. They should receive financial aid. There should be assistance as regards um, housing. There should be a, uh, assistance as regards as regard mental and emotional health, uh, as well as <clears throat> provision for physical uh, health problems. And in the survey that Engender Right, Outright, and, and Sage conducted, we also found that um, many of them uh, expressed their desire to have uh, trainings as regard livelihood skills, um, and even uh, how to access government services, um, and even how to stay. And um, that would be all for now. Thank you, Claire. How about Sarita? What, what's happening in Nepal? Uh, yes, almost uh, the things are the similar uh, as in the Philippines, but there are a few things that I would like to highlight. And thank you so much for this space to share my experience working with our elders. So the most important thing that we found is uh, the legal barrier because uh, you know, so many of the community members, especially the elders, they don't have the seniors, I mean, they don't have citizenship. 
because of their identity and because of the family, uh, they are not allowed to get the uh, citizenship because in Nepal, uh, one of the family member, especially father or mother, have to sign on, uh, you know, a citizenship card. So, uh, you know, the the family are not supportive. So that's why many of the community members they don't have. Uh, citizenship and because of that they are not allowed to open a bank and even they cannot get the senior citizen allowance so uh, and also you know some of the uh, elders have adopted a child since uh, child adoption is not you know allowed for the community members but some of them adopt uh, their child uh, for their elders, uh, but there is also a complications for them now because of that child. They are facing the you know uh, birth registration of that child, and also they are you know facing uh, mental health issues because they are not able to you know registration their child whom they adopted, and so many questions and concern are happening at the same time. So that makes them you know the stress level are high, the anxiety and so many things are happening to them. So that is also one of the things that we found. And another is the forced marriage, uh, you know, so many of the community members, especially, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the elders are forced to marry with the opposite sex. Uh, and some of them are also married when they are young at, you know, 16, 17, so at that time, uh, they have to marry with the partners whom their family, you know, select. So that is also one of the areas that we found that uh, during the, you know, uh, survey. And and also, uh, so we found that there is a housing issues also, you know, uh, in different parts of Nepal that the community members are living in a barren land or open land that are not registered as in a personal so that uh, lands are from the government and since they are disowned by their family and they don't have any house and they so so they have been started to living those areas and that is also one of the things that they share so it makes us own always you know our mental health status is not good because we don't know what will happen to our home where we are staying there you know so this is also housing issues is also one of the things that our elders is suffering and also we uh, ask them about the how covid has impacted them and since many of the community members are work in an informal sector so you know during the COVID also they have been suffering different issues like paying rents and also offering the foods and also the medication since working in the informal sector and uh, you know they don't have any secure uh, any 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 money so at that time they are not afford to medicines and even they cannot pay the house rent so it was so difficult for them uh, who work in informal sector, like, you know, sex workers or dancers. So these things also they face. And, um, and also we found uh, that, you know, some of the religious, you know, religious issues like, you know, in Tharu community. So since um, our community members, uh, especially the trans people are invited during different ceremonies and, and and Tharu communities they accept the communities uh, uh, communities uh, so during that uh, you know uh, ceremonies because they invited in that ceremonies uh, for the blessings and all those things and after that they I mean they have been facing different kinds of violence and stigma. So this is also another things that we found. And also one of the transgender women shared that, you know, uh, she is Muslim and she, had, uh, she has been working as a sex worker, but in her community, she has to pay a fine because of the work that she has been doing. So this is also uh, interest, interesting, or this is also one of the things that we found. And also we found that there is a discrimination on wages 
um, uh, since you know uh, many of the um, elders from uh, I mean from from this survey that we found that they uh, have been working as a dancer and they have been invited from different provinces and when it comes about you know so so the for instance if someone invite uh, our elders and they thought they are young and when it when they went that program and 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 they saw they are elders and there is always discrimination because of their age so you know some of the you know elders here that even we are not paid uh, sometimes we don't have even travel costs to travel from that place to our home place so this kind this, these things also we have been you know facing these days so yeah these are the areas and these are the issues that you know our community members have been facing and lastly i just want to highlight that mm, uh, since in Nepal, so we have a Senior Citizenship Act 2006, but that is also specific in, to that those act is uh, the heteronormative. So that uh, act did not include the LGBTI elders people, you know, so in, in the definition and also the, you know, the services and the provision that are provided to the senior citizens. Uh, uh, citizens, but our elders, they have not been able to, you know, receive that allowance, any health services and anything. So, yeah. Thank you, Sarita. I think uh, my second question will, you're going to have to repeat that an, uh, answer to us. So, um, with the Philippines and Nepal, we just started the project uh, late last year. So, I'm very interested uh, with Frank's sharing uh, for Taiwan hotline. So, Frank? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> um, talking about the LGBT elders in Taiwan, and I think it has to uh, go to the history of Taiwan, that when the nationalist government retreat from Taiwan, uh, from China to Taiwan, they implement martial law in Taiwan for 38 years, which means the freedom of speech and the freedom to associate and is deprived. Um, and during that martial law, the LGBT cannot have their own voice and you cannot come together and to form your community. So uh, even though the martial law has been ended for more than 30 years, but the internalized authoritarian has continued to silence their voice. And the LGBT uh, elders person in Taiwan, they face uh, double disadvantage. They are marginalized in two ways. The first way is that they have to uh, hide their identity in a heterosexual society. Uh, when they grow up, there is no way that, that they, they, there's no choice. They have to marry a woman because uh, uh, not marry is seen as abnormal. So, so most of them are forced go into heterosexual marriage and live a double life. On the other hand, uh, they are rejected by the gay community because we emphasize on youth, on, on perfect body. So I think the elder is really facing the double uh, marginalization. And because of the internalized homophobia, the LGBT person, they still are mostly invisible in the public domain, such as the long-term care or elderly services and healthcare. If you ask the service provider, have you served any LGBT client? They will say no, they did not see any. So I think the invisibility of the elderly LGBT that become a pro uh, become problematic. And I want to uh, emphasize on the uh, intergenerational gap within the LGBT community, <laughs> that even though Taiwan has the biggest uh, gay parade uh, in Asia, but from the picture, you can see that most people who get on the parade are uh, showing their youth, young body and and, and, and that really create an atmosphere that 
an aging body is not welcome, it's not popular here. And another issue is even though we have LGBTQ movement developed in Taiwan for more than 20 years, but the resources are still unequally and unevenly distributed among the island. So uh, there are uh, elderly who are at with lower education level or they are in the uh, heterosexual marriage status or they are in a, a, a rural area, they won't have access uh, to the LGBTQ resources. And one of the most urgent issue for me is the HIV positive elderly person that they don't have access or they are discriminated in the medical care or even long-term care. They, uh, they will simply reject to provide service to them and that become a very urgent issues here in Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. So as mentioned by our speakers, the lifelong discrimination experienced by older LGBTIQ persons has dramatically impacted the quality of life they are experiencing at present. So aside from the work we do, such as lobbying for anti-discrimination laws, LGBTIQ inclusive policies and programs for LGBTIQ persons, what specific laws policies and programs do older LGBTIQ persons need to address their particular concerns of older persons? So you can also share what have you been doing with your present work and also the recommendations. So let's start with Claire from the Philippines. Okay. Um, so again, um, we also found that um, uh, when they're older, uh, even when they were young, uh, they would um, support family and nephews, nieces, for example. When they're older, um, they're unable to rely on um, their uh, parents, their siblings, their nephews, their nieces, whom they supported when they were younger. So that's why um, we feel it's very important um, that we we push for universal pension, for example. And the universal pension uh, should cover not just uh, the indigent um, uh, people and not just under the present law in the Philippines, the Senior uh, Citizens Act, not just the 60 and above, um, but also um, um, 50 years old and above. And from our survey, uh, we found that the uh, over 100 older LGBTI people uh, uh, favored this kind of universal universal pension, not just for the indigent, uh, older LGBTI people, but also for 50 years old and above. Um, also, uh, it's very important to have uh, um, um, laws that would ensure affirmative action for older LGBTI people because um, as discussed by all of the speakers, uh, they have suffered uh, lifelong discrimination. And as a result, they've been in a disadvantaged position. And this would show uh, there that the impact of poverty and isolation would be very different for the older LGBTI people. So that's why um, um, I particularly like uh, for example, this new law in New York passed just this October 2022, which recognized the uh, disadvantaged position of older LGBTI people. Uh, and so we need something similar in the Philippines where uh, here they were proposing, uh, they, they passed a law uh, which provided for access to physical and mental health care um, of older LGBTI people. Um, they also provide for free or discounted meal delivery, um, um, ensuring caregivers. And of course, um, as has been seen in, in uh, the experience of older LGBTI people in the Philippines, um, for any kind of consideration of older LGBTI people who are most in need, we should consider SOGI uh, as a clear intersectionality. Uh, that should be considered in, in uh, those who are uh, 
included in a uh, consideration of those who are most in need. And so um, even, even Sarita mentioned that, that um, uh, LGBTI people have long been excluded from government programs. Uh, we also saw that in the Philippines where um, um, at some point, especially during the pandemic, the COVID uh, pandemic, um, they were, if they are in relationships, many were not considered as partners. So they were not able to receive cash aid as a family. They were not recognized as a family. Uh, only subsequently when um, the government, even national and local government started considering providing cash aid for um, um, single people, that's the only time uh, some of the older LGBTI people received aid. And so that's why it's very important to have inclusive uh, policies and programs. Um, and so, as mentioned earlier, social security, financial aid, housing, whether in the national level and in the local level would be very important. When I say local, that would be the local government, the cities, municipalities, provinces. Uh, and in the Philippines, we have what is called the barangay um, or the community level types of uh, governance. Uh, also, I'm I'm calling for the corporate social responsibility and the social civic groups uh, to definitely take into consideration older older LGBTI people um, as one uh, group uh, who clearly need um, assistance. And so, continuous training would be very important. We also found that older LGBTI people. Uh, May, may also not have um, the new technology, for example, self, uh, the smart cell phones, um, where you have the applications. Uh, plus, uh, they also need tutorial. So here is where simple kinds of programs where uh, providing cell phones and providing tutorials. And um, I'm happy to note that uh, outright and engender right um, we came out with a, a solution where some of the respondents, older LGBTI respondents, did not have cell phones and would have, they would end up watch, uh, joining our training in a, in through one cell phone and they would be two or three watching in, in that uh, cell phone. Uh, we came up with a cell phone donation drive and, and, and to me that's a, a significant effort because um, um, it's actually something palpable that they can really, uh, that's useful to them. Uh, and so again, I would like to repeat the livelihood skills training, government services, and even saving type of how to save is very important to them. Thank you, Claire. So, uh, so universal pension livelihood, you just mentioned that. So in, in Nepal, uh, what is the recommendation for addressing the needs of older LGBTIQ persons, Sarita? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, as, as you may know about, uh, the constitution of Nepal has already protected the rights of LGBTIQ people in Article 12, uh, Citizenship, Article 18, Right to Equality, and Article 42, Right to Social Justice. But the reality is still it is not yet implemented properly. So uh, my major uh, concern and the recommendation is um, to, you know, um, to implement proper implementation of the constitutions. And also, you know, there should be a reflection of the, you know, when it when it comes about the making the laws and process. So during that time, so we should break the, you know, uh, binary system uh, because you know so when it when when the lawmakers uh, are work on the law so at that time they just focus on men and women so they just skip the you know human rights of lgbtiq people and especially for the you know lgbti elders they are always been biased on that uh, you know process so since we have senior citizenship act uh, which I already mentioned that the definition of the senior citizen and the services that are providing 
that also exclude the LGBTI elders, since this is a new concept. Even we have the uh, women, children, and senior citizen ministry, and we have been, you know, uh, advocating with them that there is LGBTI elders, senior citizen, and you should incorporate their voice in the laws and programs that the ministry, ministry, ministry will do, and they are doing, you know. So that is also one of the things that uh, the uh, ministry should also focus on the LGBTI elders. And also recently uh, there was a federal election happening and there is not any participation of the LGBTI. I mean, there is a participation of LGBTI community, but there is not any specific, you know, uh, reservation or specific uh, quotas for LGBTI community. So means our senior citizens are also actively involved in different political parties, but their political participation is not yet recognized by the political party. So we want our elders in the political parties so that they can bring our issues in the different political parties. And also there in Nepal, there are different federation on LG, uh, different federation who are working on the elders issues. So we have been advocating with them that, um, you know, there are LGBTI elders and you should also include our elders in your federation in the programs that you are, you know, conducted. So we have been also, you know, building allies, building relationship and network with those allies and the federation. And also we do have different shelters by the government of Nepal and private sector. So uh, we are trying to, you know, uh, build a, a network with them so that we can include the LGBTI elders uh, in their you know in, in in their shelter homes and and also we found that during the lockdown one of our transgender men who's uh, who have been living together since more than 20 years and 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 uh, the major thing is he died and uh, his partner uh, sees now single women and is not getting the you know single women allowances because Nepal in Nepal so there is a single woman allowance uh, allowance for the single women but she is not yet counted as a single woman since her husband was her partner was died uh, because of the COVID and the you know diseases that he had so this is also another concern that we have been you know uh, you know raising these issues with the single women movements uh, in Nepal so that is also and lastly uh, there should be uh, economic empowerment uh, for the LGBTI elders people because you know since many of the community members are this one and because of the is uh, I mean they are also you know they have to um, quit their job because of their is uh, that people they do not consider uh, so so yeah the last thing is economic empowerment for our elders so that they can sustain their life as as they want so yeah thank you Sarita um, and now Frank from Taiwan Okay, um, <clears throat> share my screen. Um, changes come from external, but in Taiwan, we started from internal community solidarity. That we asked the question in Tongzhi hotline that do we really know the LGBT elders by ourselves? Then we found that we don't know them. There's no elderly. LGBT that live around us, that we know their life experience. So in 2005, we initiate a tax force on LGBT elders. We started by doing life history interview with elderly gay men, and then with elderly lesbian. So we published two books, and the first one is elderly gay men. And we started some a small program like one day tour outing. Uh, so the young volunteer go out with the elderly LGBT people. And we also go out to do uh, LGBT friendly training for the professional. Um, but what's important is that we rebuild the connection between the Tongzhi hotline and with the elderly gay community. 
So the picture that you saw is um, he is the owner of a gay sauna. He has been running the sauna for 30 years. So he knows a lot of LGBT. Uh, she, he knows a lot elderly gay men. So when we want to do the interview, um, uh, the, the owner refer many of his customer to us. Then we begin to know the elderly gay men. So when we make that connection, and uh, so they begin to uh, join the gay parade. This is the gay parade that we have a slogan for them. So I want to say that we started internal rather than external asking law or policy, because we, if we don't come together as a community, the changes uh, cannot just come from external. So, uh, but at the same time, we also engage in policy debate. For example, like 2004, we passed the Gender Equality Act. So all the school that they, the children will learn about LGBT, now the, the law has been passing for more than, for almost 20 years. So that really changes. So the young generation now, they know what is LGBT. So they come out easily without much burden and the teacher are required to provide LGBT education. And at the same time, like Long-Term Care Act passed in 2016, uh, they also have the non-discrimination based upon gender. And they also want to have to include multiple gender in needs assessment and also required courses on professional training. So all those law has been uh, included. And as you know, the Equal Marriage Act has been passed in Taiwan in 2019. Uh, but there is still a gap between what's said in the legal term and what happened in the daily life. What we really lack is the program that uh, can make the life easier for elderly gay men. Like a Family Violence Act, even though it passed in 1998, but LGBT is not included uh, in the law. So the hotline working with the feminist uh, organization, we started a program uh, for LGBT family violence uh, program in 2020. Um, but at the same time, I think the most important thing is that we need our own person uh, get involved with the politics. So these are two renowned figure of LGBT politician in Taiwan. The first one is a cabinet member, Audrey Tong. He or she, she is the minister of digital development ministry. No, she is the first one. And we also have a city councilor, uh, Mel Boya. He, she is now Taipei city councilor and being reelected re last month again. So I think how to improve, increase the political involvement of LGBT is equally important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I go to my third and last question, I, I'm still curious about, are there laws on elder abuse in your countries? Uh, and is, is it inclusive of LGBTIQ older persons? And what about the experience of older LGBTIQ persons in government and private, privately run retirement homes? Can you share some uh, insights if there are any, Claire, from the Philippines? Okay. Um, well, in the Philippines, there's still uh, work to do uh, to enact a law on LGBTIQ elderly abuse so um what we have so far would be the the current existing laws which would apply to all uh but of course that would not suffice and um as regard um abuses in in um shelters uh we have still yet to research on that thank you sarita what about in nepal 
So specific we don't have such provision in Nepal, but we have uh, so women uh, commission have one uh, GVV shelter and hotlines too. So if some you know some of uh, the elders from uh, you know LGBTI community are the survivor of gender based violence, then they can also you know call the hotline numbers and file uh, you know so they can share the story and if they want any uh, you Know, legal aid or counseling or even shelter, then they can apply for it. But the major concern is uh, does that you know uh, shelter home LGBT friendly or not? So, uh, so for for I mean I have one experience that one of the lesbian since we don't have any shelter home and I refer her to that shelter home and after one week we got a call that she should took from that shelter home because she is lesbian. So this is the situation means we have uh, you know few services but that is not LGBTI friendly so yeah thanks Sarita how about Frank from Taiwan yeah we have family violence act in Taiwan so the el elderly abuse is covered and theoretically LGBT elderly should be covered but we found that when LGBT uh, when they come into the system they don't trust the system and they are very suspicious about the social worker, whether a social worker really appreciate or can accept their lifestyle. So the relation is very difficult to establish. Usually they were, they, they were referred, but they just disappeared. Simply once they sense the, that, uh, the insecurity from the professional, then they, they will disappear. I think mainly because they don't want their lifestyle to be seen and to be scrutinized by outsiders. So I think uh, we have the system, but the system is not working uh, for LGBT people. Thank you. Thank you for answering my impromptu questions. So uh, for my last question, we know that uh, we have experienced how identity politics of specific identities and sectors um, has not been very effective in ensuring that the diverse identities one person have are being addressed. So what is your recommendation as seasoned LGBTIQ activists to other human rights activists working on LGBTIQ rights to have an intersectional lens in our human rights work for LGBTIQ persons? So Claire, from the Philippines, please start. Okay. Um, well, uh, um, I would say that uh, the lifelong discrimination of and the historical discrimination of older LGBTI people places them at a disadvantaged position. And so uh, that's why it's very important to take, uh, to highlight the plight and concerns of older LGBTI people in um, the work of LGBTI human rights activists um, as regards uh, advocating laws and policies, and even access to services. And so to me, um, advocating and learning about the issues of older LGBTI people would bolster uh, the advocacy on um, SOGI rights. Um, and this would also uh, uh, would be a great opportunity to push for uh, the urgent need to address discrimination based on SOGI. Uh, early on, uh, and, and this would be at, at, um, uh, as a young LGBTI person. And so that's why um, the activists should consider aging as an issue, uh, also together with um, poverty, socioeconomic status or class, uh, issues related to health, and for, for instance, also even uh, physical mental health and even uh, the issues of HIV, um, uh, among others, disability as well. Um, as older people uh, age, they suffer from uh, more disabilities uh, compared to when they were young. Uh, and so always also consider sex and gender um, in the advocacy. Also um, religion, uh, whether um, oppressive religious beliefs or the practice of religion, uh, would be impacted as a as as an LGBTI person, and so also as regards sectors or issues related to 
uh, work, employment, education. These are all very important issues uh, that should be considered uh, in our advocacy. Thanks, Claire. Sarita? Uh, yes, I mean, the experiences, I mean, through the, through the project that we are working with our elders, this is also a learning for us uh, at the same time and working with them and listening to them. So since we, I mean, most of the, so I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this context from the Nepal that the movement that we lead and we are working. So we always focus on the young people and we also, you know, we also try to incorporate young boys in each and every programs and the plans that we did. But please don't forget our elders because they are the one who lead our movement movement so you know so I heard so many stories from uh, the elders that we have been always biased from the move, uh, movement we feel that we have been biased and 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 to whom we share our stories because we are disowned by our family and even the movement is also co not collecting the voice of the incorporating the voice of the elders then who should you know you know uh, who should speak uh, our voice so Please do not forget uh, our elders and include them in each and every program so that they can realize that we are there for them. And one of the thing, and the another thing is many of the community members in Nepal that they are not, you know, financially stable, even they don't have the proper educations. And even there are so many barriers like language, caste, class, religion. I mean, there is an intersectional issues in the elders also. So we have to think about that and we should in, include them uh, in the, you know, different training so that we can empower them so that they can also raise the voice of LGBTIQ elders in their own areas where they are living, you know. So we also found that, uh, you know, uh, within our elders and um, the another is economic empowerment is also really needed for our elders because um, you know um, because because uh, of their age so they have been I mean, they have uh, they are forced to leave their job but the uh, the but they are confident that yeah, I know my age is growing up but I have that confidence I can work. So that also we can, you know, so they have their expertise. So please, you know, use their expertise, in, you know, during the advocacy time, or maybe you can use their, you know, personal stories while we are doing the, you know, advocacy. So, so that they are also a part of our movement. So include them in each and every programs and plans so that we can achieve the, you know, goals and the missions that we have uh you know build so yeah thank you sarita and frank yes um i think one of the most important thing is to create safe space for the elderly to come out and to share their life story and i think uh such as when we do the life history interview uh the program doesn't end when we publish the book, that in all our events, we continue to invite the LGBT elders to come up in public to share their story, such as uh, in our annual fundraising event, we each year we invite different elderly gay men and lesbians to come up on the stage and to be cheered by the whole community. And I think that's very empowering especially for a Chinese person, that we have this image of three generation comes together. But the gay community never only have like a parents come and the children, but we never have grandparents coming to our gathering. So I still remember when Mr. Wong in his like 88, he came out on the stage that everybody almost cry that we have our grand grandfather so I want to say that uh, the community building and advocacy must come together. Uh, I want to share an experience that we have a task force on marginalized LGBTQ in 2005, that we choose five excluded LGBT community as a target, that in Taipei, we started with elderly, and in Xinzhou, they started with lesbian mother, 
So they kind of are gathering lesbian mother to, together to talk about how they have to, how they get pregnant, how they raise, and so they share. And 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 that that program finally lived into Equal Marriage Act in 2014. So it takes time for the community to form, and so changes uh, come from the bottom. And in those five projects, one of the projects is indigenous elderly, LGBT in Kaohsiung. And now it turned into a music festival. And the, those LGBT indigenous people, a lot of them are artists. So we started with a, with a four person chorus in a Christian church, and then expanded into a group of into a group of indigenous artists coming together to have music festival. They just have the fourth uh, music festival uh, in Taidong. Uh, last week I was there. They call, they call themselves Adu, Adu Festival. Adu is an indigenous term. So the recommendation we have is that first be together and build community and always looking for brothers and sisters who are excluded and so make effort to include them. But we have to be patient because it takes time and don't lose hope. Um, it takes us 17 years for the elderly issue to be noticed and the equal marriage to be passed. And most of all, we need to find allies with other social movement, especially women's movement or labor movement. We need to come together. And mostly don't forget to write down what we have done and publish and make it available for all. And I want to say that we just published a book that one of our member who wrote this 30 years of uh, LGBT movement in Taiwan, that he document every single event that happened in Taiwan. So we have our history and we make our history and by coming together. So that will be our recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Frank, is that book available in English or in other language? No, not yet. It's in Mandarin. It's in Chinese. Yeah, I think we're going to learn a lot from uh, the Tongsi movement. And but it, the lesbian book is... has been translated into Japanese. Yeah, mm -hmm. will be it translated into Japanese. Mm -hmm. Just inform us if it's uh, in English so we can get that book um, well learn from there your are in movie. english audience certainly that would be something we can do yes. yes thank you so uh we have to come together and that's also the problem we are not documenting everything and we have to you know that's a very good recommendation so we are now opening the session to questions from our audience so i already have two so first question i think this is for you frank uh, from Hannah Yor of Sage Foundation. Thank you for your work and, and this wonderful presentation. Could you share more about the intergenerational component of this work based on your observations? To what extent have younger LGBTIQ persons embraced LGBTIQ older adults in movement work and advocacy? What are opportunities and or barriers for this kind of intergenerational collaboration? So Frank, <laughs> before you answer, before you answer, I'm going to also ask the second question so you can answer both and then Claire and Sarita can answer the second. So this is uh, from Jennifer from Outright and Taiwan. I'm wondering how can we empower LGBTIQ elders to come out and speak for themselves since story storytelling is one of the most important strategies in the movements. Can you share some of the experiences or good practices? So we start with Frank and then Claire and then Sarita. Okay. Um, take the live history interview, uh, for example, that all the volunteers, they are young gay men. When they interview the elderly gay men, a lot of the um, uh, interaction happened, dialogue happened, such as the young gay man uh, was wondering why you force yourself to get married and live a double life. This is uh, something unimaginable by young gay men because coming out, it, it becomes so easy for them. So uh, getting married with a woman uh, for them is 
is not being true, true to yourself. So when they start, uh, when they after they interview, they begin to understand the historical context that the situation are totally different. So this kind of reconciliation and mutual understanding happens when we do the interview, when every encounter happens, uh, so we can see each other uh, 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 in different position. So each volunteer write the story for the elders, but at the same time, we require the volunteer also come out uh, at the same time, who I am, and this is how I understand the elders' story. So, so the text actually has two voices. And I think that's something intergenerational understanding uh, coming occur at the book when the book uh, uh, is published. So this is something that we have been documenting. So that's the answer for you, Hannah. And for Jennifer, I, I think I have answered that in my previous presentation, yes. Okay, thank you, Frank. Uh, clear? Okay, um, well, uh, particular to uh, the younger people, um, to, to, to Hannah's um, question, um, I think, um, well, for us in the project, they assisted us in the data gathering. Um, there's interest in learning about uh, the concerns and needs of older LGBTI people, uh, but, um, just like many of us, there's still a lack of awareness on, on the issues and concerns of older LGBTI people. And so um, that's why it's very important to have an intergenerational approach where uh, the younger people would learn about the uh, concerns and needs and even the um, insight uh, of older LGBTI people, so as, uh, for example, um, um, even learning from, from past mistakes um, or best practices and resilience, um, that would be very important. Thanks, Claire and Saripa. Uh, so I have two experiences, that the, the two questions, that one is, uh, uh, so, so since we have been providing different types of trainings to the community members, so where we include young people and also elders too. Uh, so, you know, so we found that there, there was, a, you know, um, um, debate between young and elders uh, from the community members. And so we have been always a breeze to play a vital role between young uh, community members and elders. So, uh, so, so how we have been, you know, uh, using the experiences or mobilizing the experiences that our elders had. So we always prioritize their, you know, Mm, their experiences that you know so it was not easy for us to because so when we start our training so we always uh, you know share the experiences that how the movement was started and how was the situation and the young can you know learn from the you know uh, the, the young can learn from the elders so they are also one of so we they are also one of the ones so who play a great role when the you know homosexuality was not you know uh, accepted by the communities by the you know by the society and other people so at that time it was not easy to open up so we have been you know uh, we have been always asked to the elders to share their personal experience how they have been you know advocacy with the local governments so so they share these questions and 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 we found that the young people so we have social media, we can share our stories in social media, so we don't need such kind of, you know, advocacy, all these things. So, so we, we, we always try to incorporate those uh, thoughts from young and, you know, elders so that, so we give them 
or a space where elders can also share their experience and where the young uh, you know community members can also share their experience on same platform so that both of them can learn so how to use the you know social media during the advocacy time and how they can you know young people can learn the strategy that our elders have been used when there was not there was uh, not any organization so so this is how we you know we try to include the voice from the young and elders and talking about the Jennifer's questions that it is not easy for us as well. So, you know, the storytelling, empower, empowering them is not easy for us as well, since this is the first time that we have been specifically work with the elders. Uh, so we also found so many difficulties, but the strategy that we use was so when we had a conversation with the elders and 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 had a conversation, some of them are so vocal, they want to, you know, open and share their stories and how we start, uh, uh, how we use the strategy is so we insist the, uh, you know, the uh, elders who is vocal so could you please share your thoughts and and also we we ask them that the storytelling how it uh, you know plays a great role while doing advocacy with the lawmakers and so this is how we share you know our experiences with them and also we uh, we share them some of the stories that we have documented during that conversation or meeting, this is how we use the story while we do the lobby and advocacy. And some of them were convinced and some of them are still not yet con convinced because, you know, so the convinced people are uh, already open and not convinced people are still in the closet. So, uh, so you know, so we use the uh, so we uh, so if I mean, some of them are ready to use their voice. Uh, you know, so that we can, you know, record their voice and we can also use those voice during the, you know, advocacy time and also the story where we use the pictures from, I mean, we, we don't use their pictures, we just write their stories and share that stories with the, you know, lawmakers and with the other stakeholders, you know, and also, yeah, so these are the things that we did. If they are, some some of them are, interest, uh, are interested to share their story, but they are not open, so if they want, then we just collect their stories and write a quote or a story or experiences, and we uh, we just use those story in our, you know, advocacy time process. And yeah. Okay, so we only have seven minutes left before our time is up. So I we still have three questions. So. Um, I encourage uh, our audience to directly message our speakers if you have questions or are interested in working on issues of older LGBTIQ persons. Um, but right now, because this is a very short question uh, from Grace, um, in many Asian countries, maybe one or two sentences from uh, our panel of speakers, and many Asian countries, LGBTIQ people who are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s may not have had an LGBTIQ movement when they were coming up or growing up. Living double lives was, is for many elders as the thing to do. How have you addressed this with elders while respecting their choices? So Claire and then Fra and Sarita and then Frank. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to address Grace's question uh, at the same time Jennifer's uh, question. Um, in the work that we did with this project, um, we um, we came up with trainings, and in the trainings we discussed, for example, the rights to soji, human rights of LGBTI people, uh, and throughout the process, um, we would also conduct trainings in uh, how they can be spokespersons. We we found that some would still really have internalized discrimination of, of, of internalized homophobia, transphobia, biphobia. Uh, and so um, it's very important um, um, to be able to for them to be able to identify this. And um, we recognize the whatever historical uh, experiences they they had. Uh, but at the same time, we also want them to be empowered. Uh, and so that's why 
uh, we also made um, a process where we were very consultative in, in our work, whether it was the survey uh, or whether the development of the questions, whether this was about um, presenting the results of our, uh, of our research. Uh, we discussed this with them uh, and they would comment uh, and a lot of times we were able to also uh, now uh, we are empowering uh, our older LGBTI people as spokespersons. And so they are also the ones who are uh, the discussants now and the speakers in some of the presentations of our uh, research. Okay, with the with five minutes remaining, Sarita and Frank, two and a half minutes each. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. I mean, uh, the movement was started in two thousand. I mean, two thousand one in Nepal. So I mean, it's 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 so many back years. So we found few of few eld. I mean, uh, few elders who still didn't know about the terminology that are used for the community members that are used for the feelings that they do have. Because still they don't have, uh, you know, uh, the they don't uh, know the existing laws and policies uh, that are addressed in, in the, you know, constitutions or in different laws. So how we are trying to, you know, build their capacity is providing information about the, you know, LGBTI terminology, how the local language are used for the LGBTI community, and how the laws and policies are, you know, uh, are for the LGBTI community. So uh, we have been, you know, sharing such things to the community member and also, uh, so we are imp we are imp empowering them through the, you know, storytelling, through the capacity building and how to, you know, speak with the lawmakers. So uh, also we are building the capacity that, so how they can, you know, raise their voice from, uh, uh, raise their voice in local levels or in the national levels, so yeah. Thank you, Sarita. And Frank? I would oh, like to <laughs> emphasize on the importance of storytelling because the storytelling, people define who they are by telling story. Even the elderly, if they have something incomplete in their life, they will be able to make that, uh, uh, correct that, or kind of fulfill who they are by telling the story. So what we can do is provide a chances for them to tell their story. And I think that's something fundamentally uh, we can change and empower the elderly. And for example, like we have the uh, Gender Equality Education Act. So there, there, there are, uh, the school are required to provide LGBT education. So those chances provide opportunity for the elderly to tell their story. And also for, for LGBT people to go back to the school where they graduate and tell their story as an al alumni. So I think uh, 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 legal changes or program policy are important, but something must come up from the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, as advocacy uh, group that we need to work at both way, that we need to uh, uh, really have the community form and provide the chances for people to come together to share their story. So I think that's important. That, and I think that's something uh, we can do uh, as a whole together to provide this uh, space for the elderly to come out to share their story. And someone will hear and someone will be encouraged by hearing other stories so they feel that they want to tell their story. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, our panel of speakers, Claire Padilla from the Philippines, Sarita from Nepal and Frank from Taiwan. We have so many questions, but we're running out of time. So thank you. And we hope uh, you get in touch with our speakers and you, can, you watch the second session on self-care happening after this session. So thank you to the, our audience. Take care of yourself and each other. 